and uh, uh, it's a great honor for me to be here with you and uh, sharing some of my work in Lubini, uh, the most sacred place in this planet where the Buddha came to the world. Uh, it is not a, my research work, it is just to give you a simple glance, an introduction of Lubini. So generally, we just know that Lumbini is a birthplace of Buddha. But what's happening inside Lumbini? Generally, uh, when we go for pilgrimage, we go to the birthplace of Buddha, we just observe this Ashoka pillar, and uh, we come some places, we sit, we meditate, and we move it. But Lumbini it is it's a big area, it's a big master plan. Uh, sometimes I often say that it is one of the best master plan uh, in Asia. So the designer, I will talk more about uh, the designer when I explain on the master plan of your building. Uh, so you will know that what this master plan is and how big it is and what's happening, what's going on in your building. So this will be the uh, kind of a small introduction. Uh, so this uh, first slide uh, uh, I just wanted to put it here like that, you know, see Lumbini uh, in the uh, 19th century, Lumbini was a big mound. The whole archaeological thing was all fallen down and that became a big hillock and there are many trees and the shrub that covered the whole of this birthplace of Buddha. This beautiful, this column today, you see like this, it was just one in the top part here. This was visible. It's about one in the six to seven feet was visible, and the rest it was under the ground. So it was rediscovered, I will give more detail on that, in 1896. So they dug this whole area, not only this area, one in this part only, and they found this pillar like this. So this photograph taken in 1896, December 1st. So when they discovered this, and they found the inscription uh, written in the pillar, and that is inscription, uh, you know, is one of the most important inscription for the history of Lumbini and the further life of the Buddha. So same pillar, you know, in 1930s, you can see there is agricultural field next to the pillar. This is a private land, you know, this is a paddy field. So the people, they used to, you know, have you know, agriculture next to the pillar. So in 1962, uh, some archaeologists try to know the foundation of pillar and this is a study and today the pillar is well preserved and it is with us. So this is just so you know the introduction of the slide. And today you see Lumbini. So this is uh, you know the main temple in Lumbini which we call the Maya Devi temple. So this is the master plan of Lumbini. So you will see later on. So this is uh, uh, the birthplace of the Buddha. This is a bone where the Buddha took a bath, I mean, the Maya Devi, Mother Buddha took a bath before giving birth to the child. This is a not south oriented master plan, and this is a central link. This is a 1.5 kilometer long central link, and the both side of the central link would have a pedestrian path, and uh, uh, these are the, you know, the some monasteries. You can see this is the Singapore monastery, and uh, this is one Nepali monastery, you can see this is the Bobby's Bobby monastery, and all that. So, uh, so uh, if you see the close of view, this is a you know, the birthplace of the Buddha. This is Ashoka Kolam here. Inside this Ashoka Kolam is here. Inside this building, we got the exact birth spot of the Buddha. So this is a poem where the mother of Buddha took a bath. So these are the newly developed, you know, this pedestrian in the uh, walkway, and these are the meditation center. So in so now today, you know, in uh, 1997. Lumbini, it was in the old, it, it is in the old heritage list. So, so I like to credits to the birthplace of Mother Buddha. And many people still, uh, you know, they don't know where is Lumbini. So, uh, some of the school even they, uh, you know, they teach that Lumbini is in Nepal, but it is not true. true you know, Lumbini, uh, sorry, not in India, but it is not true. It is in Nepal. So, when you see uh, in the Nepal, you know. Uh, see, this is a Nepal in the heart of the Asia. It is a small landlocked country. So you have uh, India to the east, India to the south, India to the west. 
and northeast it is China, or the, you know, autonomous uh, Tibetan region. So Nepal is a small country in between China and India. So in uh, administratively, the country, you know, uh, it is uh, it is divided into 14 zone and 75 district. So one of the district, uh, sorry, zone is called Lumbini zone. This is one of the zone, uh, named after Lumbini, and uh, there are six districts. So one of the district is called Rupandehi. It is here, and at the uh, Rupandehi, at the garden of Lumbini, this is here the Buddha was born. So it is not in India; it is in Nepal. So Lumbini, during the time of the birth of the Buddha, you know, it is here. There were two kingdoms. To the west of Lumbini, it was a Sakya kingdom, and uh, east it was the Bhutpolya kingdom. So Sakya kingdom, it was ruled by the Sakya dynasty, from where the uh, Siddhartha or the Buddha comes. And this is a Polya kingdom from where mother of Buddha and uh, her sister Prasapati, she comes from this area. So Devadaha is 32 kilometer from Lumbini, and Patilabastu uh, or Tilurambut today we call it, it is a 28 kilometer. So uh, this, during the Buddha time, it was a beautiful garden. This Lumpini, there are various name of this garden. Literature mentioned it, Lumpini Kanan, Lumpini Patika, Lumpini Upapana, Lumpini Salodhyanapana. Even one literature mentioned that Lumpini Pradimokshavana. <laughs> this Pradimoksha means a garden of Indra in the heaven. So Lumpini garden is compared to the garden of heaven. In one literature mentioned, it is a chitta latapana. Means chitta means it's a mind. Latha means captivity. So it is a mind captivating garden. So it was a more beautiful garden. And this garden was maintained by both the Sakya uh, to the west and the Koliyas to the east. So today, Kapila Vastu is about 20 kilometer. Devadaha is uh, 32 kilo, uh, sorry, 32 kilometer east of Lumbini. So, a little bit life of uh, Buddha, you know, Siddhartha, the future Buddha, he lived in Kapilabastu. This is the Kapilabastu, which is the capital city of the Sakya. Kapilabastu was a big kingdom, and this was just the capital city. This is where Siddhartha lived for 29 years. So, uh, so in the age of 16, he was married, and the age of 29, he had a son called Rahula. And when the Rahula was only 17 years old, then the he took a great renunciation from this city. So after he took a renunciation, uh, you know, he was enlightened. So some of the claims of the sacred Buddha side, Siddhartha, he was born in Lumbini, lived for 29 years in Kapilbostu, and took a great renunciation at the age of 29. And from Kapilbostu to Uribela, Bodhgaya, he practiced for six years with the different teachers and different, you know, these learned people. Then here in Bodhgaya, he was enlightened. After his enlightened, he came to Saranath and Ishipatana, where he gave the first preaching. And after he enlightened, he was 35 years old. And for 45 years, he walked all this area, and uh, uh, he, is, he, he, pre he preached his Dharma. And when he was 80 years old, he came to Kushinara. This is where he passed away. So these are the four main places of, uh, you know, the pilgrimage, like uh, Lumbini, where he was born, Bodhgaya, where he was enlightened, Saranath is the first preaching, and Mahapari Nirvana at Kushinara. So there are some other places which are related to the life of Buddha. The four places, as I mentioned you, Bodhgaya, Saranath, and Kushinara. There are other sites, which we call the minor sites. These minor sites are Nalanda, or Rasgir, sorry, it must be Rasgir, then Vaisali, this is Shravasti and Sandhasya. And there are other sites which are associated with the life of the Buddha. They are like Papil Vastu, Rajgi, then Kesariya, Pajaliputra, and there is one place somewhere here that is called the Pava. So it's, it's a place called Pava. So these are the places uh, which are related with the life of the Buddha. So, Buddha recommended to his disciple uh, to visit these four places as a pilgrimage in their lifetime. You can see this is a, you know, uh, um, a sculpture from Gandhara School of Art from Afghanistan. This is here the Buddha is lying in his deathbed 
and the Ananda is crying here. And in this time, Buddha said uh, to Ananda, Ananda Lumpini is the place where the Tathagata was born. This is the place which should be visited and seen by a person of devotion and which would cause awareness and apprehensive nature of impermanence. So these are the places where one can feel the detachment from the material world. And in the Pali world it is called Sambhaz and Andriya. They are the place of emotional things. So after Buddha passed away, so these four places became one of the most sacred places of the Buddhist pilgrimage uh, of the temple of all of the world. So this is the Pali where you are born. This is where they are. This is where you enlightened. He was enlightened city under the street. So just you know, you know under the street there is a uh, one stone slab which is called Vajrasana. So Siddhartha sitting on that spot he enlightened. So after he enlightened, he sat on that Vajrasana for one week completely and enjoying the peace of you know this uh, emancipation. So this is the you know the Mahabodhi temple today. So there are Buddha statue inside of it, and this Mahabodhi temple first structural you know, activities carried out by Emperor Ashoka in 10th century BC. And then we have some other inscriptional record that Shuka, King's wife, uh, Sarangi Devi and Naga Devi, they also did some repair for this one. The present set was constructed during 2nd century AD at the Bhubiska, there's a Kushana king called Bhubiska. During this time, this temple was completed. At that time, this was not there. This four inspired during not there. So this is the, you know, the most important site. And this is the Sarana. This is Isipatana. This is where Buddha, you know, turned the wheel of Dhamma. So this Dhamma wheel is still, you know, uh, rolling. And this is the stupa and Sarana. We call it Dhammeka stupa. So this is, the, you know, this, uh, uh, Dhamma is to go. From Dhamma it became a Dhammeka. And during the establishment of this stupa, from the center they got the you know, Buddha Sutra that's in, inscribed in a copper plate, it mentioned in Dhamma in the Brahma. So this Dhamma is for the benefit of many and benefit of happiness of many. So after this, you know, uh, now this is a Kusinara, this is where he passed away. So this, you know, this sculpture, what you see today, uh, it was discovered in 1876-77 uh, uh, by one British archaeologist, Carl Lay. When he discovered this sculpture was more than a hundred pieces. So he joined all that in pieces and he noticed that it is a beautiful, you know, this reclining Buddha. And backside of this, uh, uh, this statue, there is an inscription. This inscription says that, you know, it was donated by one monk called Bala in the 5th century AD. So this sculpture is from 5th century AD. So this is to go, which you see, it, it was created only in a, a 1956. Before that, it was not even a half portion was there. So what happened that when the Buddha passed away in Kushinara, he was cremated there. So one person of the relics, the Mala of Kushinara, they got it. They made a stupa here and it was an earthen stupa. So Ashoka came in the 3rd century BC. He took the relics, not all, he left one portion, and then he built a brick panorama. And this set was created in 1956 when India was celebrating 2500 years of the Buddha. Even this temple was created in 1956 because the Karle, he made a small room and he put this, uh, you know, this statue. But the increasing number of the people, you know, so Indian government thought that this is too small. So they, you know, they made this temple in 1956. So now here in Lubini, after Buddha passed away, Lubini is the famous center of pilgrimage. So after the death of the Buddha, the beautiful garden which I mentioned, Lubini, Kandan, Vatika, Oko, Bana, Pratimoksha, Bana, it changed into a place of a pilgrimage because Buddha asked his disciple to visit four places. So this is one of the first and foremost places. So right after the death, we have a pilgrim coming to Lumbini. For many centuries, you know, pilgrims, they have honored the spot, uh, Lumbini Garden, where the Buddha was born. So today, you know, the pilgrims and visitors all over the world come to Lumbini. 
it is a timeless place. And this monuments uh, in Lumbini, which mark the authenticity of the birth of the Buddha. So, the first recorded and most important pilgrim was the Emperor Ashoka. He came in the third century BC. So, in the third century BC, when Emperor Ashoka came to Lumbini, this became a milestone, uh, you know, milestone era of the spiritual, uh, you know, event of the Lumbini. Uh, and not only Lumbini, it is in the history of Buddhism. So, Ashoka made a royal pilgrimage. It's not like a simply or uh, it is a royal pilgrimage to the birthplace of Buddha. Here he worshipped the spot where Buddha came to the world and, you know, left many monuments to propagate the Dharma. So, now you see here, this is the Emperor Ashoka before he converts into the Buddhist. And after the conversion, this is a, you know, this Tibetan painting of 18th century. Here Ashoka is shown in a monk dress. So this is the, also we call it the Kala Ashoka. Just, you know, to annex the throne, the literature mentioned that he killed his 99 brothers, then he became a king. So, after his visit to Rubini, you know, this is a beautiful pillar he erected in Rubini. So, according to Sri we will see later on, he mentioned that there was a horse capital on the top. And this is an inscription in the pillar, which is in this part. This pillar here, it is in the Brahmi script, one of the earliest script of northern India. The language, it is called the Arthamagadi or Pali language. So Buddha always used this language, Pali language, so the people, they can understand it very easily of his teaching. So here, Ashoka, you know, uh, if you see in a Pali text, it's, a, you know, the five line with the 90 letters, he mentioned, you know, uh, here, Atana Agnacha Mahiti means I myself came to this place. Here, the Sakyamuni Buddha was born. So, he worshipped the spot where Buddha came to the world, and for a long lasting of his visit, or to commemorate his visit, he erected this pillar. So, here, the Sakyamuni Buddha was born. So, he reduced the taxes of Lord So, this is the inscription. If you see in English, you know, a 20 year year coronation personally came to this place because here the Sakyamuni Buddha was born. I worship the marker stone, that stone where Buddha came to the world, where Buddha came to the world and erected the pillar to commemorate my visit. And he reduced the taxes of the pillar because he had the Baba was born. So this is the inscription of the pillar. And after Ashoka, you know, we have a series of Chinese pilgrims, you know, we in Lumbini, in Rapa de Lumbini, uh, all the Buddhist places. One book mentions that from 4th century AD to 12th century AD, there are more than 139 Chinese pilgrims. They visited almost all the important Buddhist sites. So, the Per Lumbini, he's the first, who is known as Sensai, or Chinese text, he is known as Ji Seng, Ji Seng Ji. So he is known as the Sensei, commonly known as, uh, you know, known as Sensei. He came here in the 4th century AD. So he mentioned that I saw the exact spot where Buddha came to the world, which is sealed by a stone. And the people are offering flour and sweet to that stone. And he mentioned that there is a tree, which is local people call this tree is Ushoka, that is Ashoka tree. And when the tree is dead, Upasak Upasika bring the new Ashoka tree and the plant in the same place. And even he mentioned that there is a statue which depicts the birth of the Buddha is lying on the beneath the tree. So this is a very good informative, you know, this uh, record he left it. Then in the fifth century AD, another Chinese pilgrim is called Vizlanda Fashan. And Fashan mentioned that I came to Lumbini. I saw the pond where the mother of Buddha took a bath before giving birth to the Buddha. So from this pond to the tree which mother of Buddha created, it is a 20, 20 steps. From the pond to the tree is a 20 steps. So then he mentioned that there are two stupa. He said that when the Buddha came to the world, two dragon god came to the earth and one poured the hot water and one poured the cold water. And he mentioned that this true spot, there is a stupa. 
So after him, you know, very important Chinese pedigree, Xuanzang, he came to the really. So Xuanzang, you know, he started from a journey from China. From China, he came and he crossed the desert, Malcolm Desert. In that desert, you know, he lost his way, and for seven days, he was without water and for food. So somehow on the earth day, he just got the road and took a ride to Nubili. It took him six years. From Changan to Nubili, he walked for almost like a six year, then he arrived in Nubili. Near prayer again, near Shravasti, he was caught by the docket. They wanted to kill him and offer his blood to the goddess. So that night somehow he escaped. So this is the story of this man. And when he came to Nubili, he again mentioned the poem where the mother of Buddha took a bath before giving birth to the Buddha. He said that the poem water is so clean, even though you can, it's like you can see as your face, like a mirror. And it is full of the lotus flower. So he said that from the poem to the birth spot, the tree is 24 steps. It seems that, you know, the, there is a difference of height of fashion and stranger. Then he said that, you know, when there is a host, there is a pillar. On the top of the pillar, there is a horse capital. The horse capital is lying on the ground and it's due to lightning. The pillar is, you know, is split in the, uh, in the center, the pillar is split. And unfortunately, you know, this horse capital is missing. It fell down and, you know, maybe the local people, they broke it and they took it and put it in the cow pen or I don't know what happened to it. So, after, uh, you know, then the last, you know, recorded visitor to Lumbini is a Ripu Mala, one Western, uh, one Nepali king from the Western Nepal. This is in the Asoka pillar, right at the top of the Asoka pillar, you can see. Somewhere here, they we found this inscription. And this inscription is in a Devanagari script that like what we use today in Nepal and India. So, it, it, it is, a, you know, the Om Mani Padme Om. This seems that he was a Mahayanist. And the second line, he mentioned his name and uh, said that I am always victorious. So, after 14 centuries, we don't know uh, something happened to the building. Suddenly, such an important pilgrimage place, you know, it entered into the dark period. So, it is most probably Islam in region was there. But there is no any record in the history. But well, it's a hypothetical, you know, the calculation that Islam is very close to the building because the Lucknow is their main political center. So, uh, Lumini is about 190, uh, 200 kilometers uh, away. So, when they started expanding their political and religious, you know, these things, that was directly affected to the Lumini too. So, the Lumini, the Buddhist people, they left Lumini going towards the northern area. So, Lumini, it became, you know, uh, 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 you know a, a, a kind of a desert. So, you see the Lumini, all this, you know, they became a all these monasteries are being structured, they crumble down, they fall down, which became a big pillow, and you can see many trees grown on the top. So you, you see the pillar, which you saw just before pillar is covered, only a few feet at the top was visible. So this photograph was taken in 1956, and the Lumbini was rediscovered. What happened that, in, uh, you know, they excavated this pillar. When they excavated, they went down, and they found this inscription. The most important part is he the Buddha Jate Sakya Muniti. Here the Sakya Muni Buddha was born and there is a word Lumini Dhamme. With the help of these two words, you know, there was a big announcement that we discovered the birthplace of the Buddha. So after this discovery, all these orientalistic or the uh, you know archaeologists of that time, they concentrated on Lumini. So what happened that in 1899, again one Indian archaeologist came in. He did some research in the beginning. You can see there are two structures. So this structure was a Hindu temple. And it was always locked. And this was a small, you know, this uh, mass box, British mass box type of structure. Inside this structure, uh, the, the statue of Buddha, the boxing of the Buddha was placed here. So, and these are the uh, labor of the time in 1899. So, uh, this is you know, one archaeologist called P.C. Mukherjee. Uh, he excavated the southern part of this mound. And he said that these temples are built in a different periods, not in one period. And this seems to be a lama, you know. He is having a, a rose, you know, this 
Mala in his hand, and this seems to be the watchman in 1899. So then, uh, P.C. Mukherjee, you know, this is the man, gentleman, and uh, who he uses there's a statue of Bodhisattva. So he is uh, doing, you know, this is the structure belonging to third century BC. So he is drawing this and counting the brick layer. So this is a photograph of 1899. And not only that, Pishi Mukherjee, he identified this sculpture is the birth scene of the Buddha. So here, you know, this is a two piece. This piece was not there when he discovered it. Even there is a no leg portion. So this piece was just behind this, uh, you know, the torso. So he fixed it and he found it. This is a Maya Devi, mother of Buddha, holding a branch of a tree. She is her sister, Prajapati, supporting at a time of delivery. There are two Hindu gods. Even they came to the earth to receive Buddha, and Buddha is one here. So this is a sculpture, uh, you know, he identified in 1899. So after P.C. Mukherjee, you know, there are many important pilgrims that came to you from the meaning. <coughs> Some of them are like, you know, Anagarika uh, Thamapala, the great, you know, uh, the, the man who revived Buddhism in India, and especially in the Bodhi area. And he is a Jinnabara Bamsa. He was, uh, you know, the prince of Thailand. So these two came to Lumbini in 1898. So when they came to Lumbini, they said that the one year before uh, this Furar and uh, you know this Nepali who excavated the hole is, is still lying. So they went to see the, uh, the statue and it was covered with the cloth and they were unable to see. These are the information we get from the record. This is Alexander Daniel, the first French lady went to Tibet. And she stayed in Tibet for 20 years and written some beautiful books on magic and mystery of Tibet. So she came to Lubini in 1912. And after that, you know, this is a great Japanese whose name is Ikai Kawaguchi. He was the first Japanese to come to Nepal. So he came to Lubini. What happened that when he came to Lubini, he saw that people are offering animal sacrifice to the statue of the Buddha. So they were killing the chicken, you know, this, even the buffalo, even the goat, and they cut it and they offer it blood to that statue. When Ikai Kawaguchi came to Lumbini, he saw this. Then he wrote a letter to the then Prime Minister of Nepal. I came to Lumbini, I saw that, and, you know, people are killing animals and offering blood to the statue of the Buddha. Please stop it. The Prime Minister of Nepal never bothered it. He, did, he threw the letter of Ikai Kawaguchi. Again, Kawabuji wrote a second letter. Even the Prime Minister of Nepal didn't notice it. Again, he wrote in a third letter. The Prime Minister of Nepal, he opened the letter and he saw that, oh, people are killing animals and offering blood to the Buddha statue. So in 1925, Prime Minister of Nepal, you know, declared that from today, there will be no any animal sacrifice in the statue of Nepal. So this is Ikai Kawabuji. The credit goes to him. So after Ikai Kawakuchi, we have another great scholar of India whose name is called Rahul Sankirtana. He came to Lumini in 1920. Rahul Sankirtana is a such a great you know, scholar. He went to Tibet and he collected many original, you know, this Buddha Sutra brought back to India and translated into Sanskrit or in Pali. So this is the one who came to Nepal, I mean Rubini, and this is Giuseppe Tucci in 1952. So there are the great people, you know, they have given a lot of contribution uh, and a lot of history of Rubini during their visit. So up to then, you know, so 1900, 1900, 30, uh, 33 to 39, one Nepali gentleman, you see in 1933. This is, a, you know, the tree. People re which became a big history, history, I mean the, you know, hue and cry for the people. And this is the, you know, the uh, temple, birthplace of the Buddha. This is the Asubakula. You can see all the structures are under the ground. So this is a subject of what he did that, you know, this beautiful, this mound of Lumbini, he started living from the top without understanding the archaeology of the place. So what he did that, you know, he made a very plain ground, this mound after his 
excavation will be repeated like this. There are only hardly one or two layers of brick here, some bricks are there. So he destroyed almost all the superstructure of the baby. And not only that, this is the original pond where the mother of Buddha took a bath. This is a natural pond. See, it's a very long, it's very long baby. So he made this, you know, the modern swimming pool. Or something like that. So, so you can see the authenticity, it lost it for forever. So after him, you know, uh, since 19, 1896, there are several archaeological activities in the birthplace of Buddha. The most important activities, it was carried out in 1992 to 1996. The reason of that, you know, where they found the exact birthplace spot of the Buddha. So excavation, why we did the excavation that, you know, the reason is that there is a tree right in front of the temple. The root of this tree was creating a big problem. Not only that, when I was digging the Osaka pillar at the foundation, I noticed this root of this tree is passing almost like a 17 meter away. So it was very big danger for the temple as well as for the Osaka column. So then what happened that, you know, you see the root of this tree. So the root, you know, that was destroying the temple. So then what we did that was we removed the tree from here. We cut the tree. And after we removed that, you know, then uh, we started excavation in 1992. Then we, it continued up to 1996. So during that excavation, you see that this is before excavation of this temple. The tree is here. This root was going all the way to the pillar. So we have to protect this tree uh, sorry, this temple and Ashoka pillar. So then what we did that, you know, we removed this structure at the top first. So what we noticed that this was the creation of 1933 to 39th activities. All the bricks you know, there is a date, 1939. So this is not so important for us. So below this, these are all the original brick of the 2nd century BC, 3rd century BC. So we were very careful of removing this one. So what we did, we covered the whole plastics in and around. So we started our digging in 1992. If you see some of the sin we have taken from, you know, in our excavation, it is from the south. Another view, you see, this is our super pillar. We are digging for this area. Another view of from another direction. It is from the north. See the pillar is here. So this is the excavation. So after this excavation. The new phenomena came that, you know, this area we found 15 small chambers. So these three chambers, say one chamber here, another here, another inside it. Uh, these are the bigger than the other small chambers. So what we did that, you know, we left this part without digging. Because this is, we call it alcove remains. In this alcove remains, there are, it's a mixed type of brick. Brick from the 3rd century BC, 2nd century BC, even from the 4th century AD. So this is a creation of the late period. So we left it for the further, you know, this research. We didn't dig this part. This part, you know, we left it for the future uh, research work. I will talk more about these two chambers later on. So this is a view of the excavation from other corner. So this is from the other corner. And uh, you see that these are the small rows of this. Uh, you know, this uh, is one channels. And in here, this is the room. This is room. one more room is inside this. Inside this room, you know, these are the area where we didn't excavate. We just left it. So here we discovered this is spot. We discovered a stone piece. The first, this stone piece was like this. During our excavation, we found this stone piece. But it is inside the room. If you see here, this is a room. Inside the room, we found this stone piece. So what this stone piece is, we didn't know. It was just lying like that. Then what we did that, you know, we cut one corner. If you see this one, we cut here. We dug it. So we cut this uh, uh, area, and this stone is lying here. Then we went down, and we checked it from the section. And what we found that inside the room, there is a platform. The platform is having a seven layers of brick. 
on the plate, on the top of this platform, this stone is placed. So it means that this stone is of special significance. Why this stone is placed? Inside the room, again, there is a platform, and on the top of the platform, this stone is placed. So we didn't know what this stone exactly. And during that time, you know, so you see, this is a closer view. Then what we did that, we have an international conference in Lubini. All these great scholars, you know, is a professor Dani from uh, Sri Lanka and uh, Indians and all this group, they came to Lumbini. Then we presented a paper that, and on the basis of that Chinese sensei, who said that I came to Lumbini, I saw that stone which placed exactly on the body spot, people are offering flowering, these things. On the basis of that, we interpreted that this stone must be the exact body spot of the Buddha. Not only that, in the Oshawa pillar inscription, there is a word. In the third line, there is a word called Sila Bigadabin. Sila is a stone. Bigadabin means it, when Ashoka came and worshipped. When Ashoka came to Lumbini, the stone was lying on the ground. He was accompanied by his spiritual teacher called Upagupta or Bukali Buddha Tissa. Upagupta pointed, Emperor, that is the spot where Buddha came to the world. And this is the tree which mother of Buddha preached during the time of delivery. Also by you know, being a Buddhist king, so he just paid homage to that stone. Then he ordered, make a platform, rise up and put this stone on the top. So after that he ordered to make a brick railing in and around to protect the stone as well as the tree. So today if you go to Bodhgaya, so when temple and the tree, you can see the railing. The first railing was put by Emperor Ashoka in the first century BC. So even some of the pieces are still there, original pieces. So same exactly in Lumbini too. He ordered to make a wall in and around. So after we presented this, then the, you know all this international you know scholar, they said that yes, it is an exact wall is part of the Buddha. So it was in 1996. When we and then they said that this is the part of history. So immediately after that, you know. Immediately after uh, we discovered this, then the, you know this uh, Lumbini was enrolled in the old heritage property. So in our excavation, we found this terracotta panel. You see, this is a, a, a many pieces. It's all broken, many, many, many pieces. Then we join it each other. After joining this each other, there is a beautiful story as the uh, Mahabhiniskramana panel of Siddhartha. Here you can see this is Esodhara. She's wife. She's sleeping. And you see her, you know, the hair dress, ornaments. She is full of ornaments. And even in her leg, you know, you can see some ornaments. She is Siddhartha, having a turban in his head, even earrings, even he's also having some royal dress. And Esodhara, Esodhara's position, she's holding one dress. Means she, probably Rahula is somewhere here. So she is feeding Rahula. So this part is broken, we couldn't find the broken part. Only this piece only we, we found it. So this panel is a, one of the earliest panels uh, where we saw that Siddhartha has a great renunciation in Kapila Vastu. So this is from the 4th century AD. It's from the Gota period. So after that, you know, uh, we did further research in the birthplace of the Buddha. So it is from the 2010 to 2012. What happened in 2010 to 2012, Japan government uh, gave some fund uh, to Lubini. That is through UNESCO, not by Lubini. We got the money, they gave money to UNESCO, from UNESCO. Then we started doing more research on the workplace of the Buddha. Especially this black area, we left without the village. In 1992 to 1996, we just left these two black spots without excavation. Other side we completed. We completed the whole excavation except these two spots. So in 2010 to 2012, we concentrated these two areas. So what we did that we made a trench here. Marker stone is somewhere here. C5B is a marker stone. So this spot we made a trench. So after we dug it. You know, this is the trench we made it. 
which was not excavated in an earlier excavation. So when we did that, you know, after going down here, we, we saw some brick. Can you see this brick? It is in a carved brick. It is like in the carving style. Like if you see this one, this is like this. They were, they were in a, you know, the hidden, I mean, this is style, carved brick. If you see here, these are the bricks, same brick. And here we found a platform. A small platform made by the brick, and here you have a brick standing, supporting carved brick. So, this is the carved brick. What we did that we again we removed this carved brick. This is the brick size. It's almost like a, a 48 by 38 by 12, which is almost like a 25 kg brick, which is a uh, you know it's a pre molded brick we did it. So here what we found that you know this is a brick platform, beautifully laid it, and here is a you know the brick was carved brick. So we removed this one. After removing here, what we notice that you know you have a series of these post holes. Yes, this is a wooden granite. No, okay. Here, this is the place where we found the uh, you know uh, the marker stone, and we made a trench here. It shows that the tree is somewhere here. So to protect that tree. So you have a, you know, this post hole. It's for the wooden bread. So we got some, you know, the uh, datable material. We sent it for the radiocarbon dating. And we got the date of this material is 630 BC. So it's almost like a time of Buddha. So the traditional date is a 630 BC. So the tree was protected by red, wooden bread. So if you see this one, so this this is the you know the post hole for wooden branding. And what's the story of the temple there? When Mother of Buddha came to Lumbini, this was the tree. It's a hypothetical, you know, we just imagine. So uh, she came, village was nearby, she spent a night, I mean uh, she went to the village, uh, she took a, you know some rest, she came to the garden of Lumbini. The, you know, she got the pain and she was searching some support and she saw that tree, she came to the tree, she pulled the branch and gave birth to the child. This is the second place. This is the wooden dwelling, possibly, which I showed you before, the hole, post hole. So they made this tree as it's a relic in an era. It's imaginary because this, the post hole, why is post hole? So in a third phase, when Ashoka came to the bed, so he made a brick platform in an era. So wooden railing is still there. Okay? So Ashoka, what he did that, you know, here, Ashoka, he made a, you know, the wooden structure in an era, keeping this tree open in the center. And he erected a pillar to the west of the, uh, you know, the, the tree. This is the phase four during Ashoka's time. You see the pillar here. So today, we have like this. Pillar is here, this is under the tree. So this is, you know, how the first phase, second, third, fourth, and the fifth phase of the temple. So, now, before excavation, the temple was like this. Of course, it's a beautiful one, but unfortunately, this tree was creating a big problem. So, initial activities, so this is a wooden granite. The, the post hole we, which we discovered is for this one. So it is from the Ashoka time. What he did, he made a brick made for me in around. So the people used to sit here and meditate it. And the tree is in the center. The marker stone is underneath somewhere. And he put the Ashoka pillar at the back side. Even today, if you see here, this is Anuradhapura in Sri Lanka. You have this relic in and around, yeah. and the tree is in the center. So most probably did the same practice. The Anuradhapuram is one of the early, I mean, the, you know, uh, world history in the world. This is Encyclopedia Britannica mentioned that this tree is one of the world history in the world because this the sapling was taken, I mean, brought from Bodhgaya, 
by Ashoka's son and daughter Mahinda and Sangamitra. And they planted uh, the crops into the BC. And you see, they have uh, the same really style as in Mumbai. And even we can see this is a, a sculptural panel. So this is a tree worshiping practice. You see, the people you know, this is a Bodhi tree. And they come here and they are offering the flowers and they are worshiping the tree. So it means that the Bodhi tree was practiced as a worshiping tree, representing the Buddha. So this is how they did it. And after that, you know, we have big numbers of tourists, in, especially in Nepali. They are all Hindu. This is very interesting, you know, in that the uh, uh, local Nepali uh, who come to Lumbini, you know, there are more than 10,000 10, 10, people, they come every year in Lumbini. Sometimes nine, you know, it's not an exact number, but the, the highest number of visitors in Lumbini they are Nepali. And they are 99% they are Hindu. Because Lumbini is regarded as a Devi, you know, Ganesh. It's a Lumbini Devi. Devi means it's a Ganesh. So they come to worship the Ganesh. And then we have, of course, few numbers of tourists or you know, the Buddhist people. They are not more than 100,000. So when they come there, you know, this is a Thai mom. And another big problem for us is that when the Sri Lankan comes, they want to offer this flower everywhere. <laughs> We cannot stop their sentiment. And especially when the Taiwanese comes, they carry the perfume. They put the perfume in a pillar, a sugar pillar. Thai comes with a leaf, gold leaf. They go and you know, they put it in the mansion. When the Tibetan comes, they break the structure and eat the bread. When the Burmese comes, they collect the swag, you know. They dig everywhere and they put in a plastic and they carry. So, I haven't seen Malaysian, you know. Uh, uh, maybe I'll, I'll notice uh, next time. Uh, what's your activities? Uh, okay. Uh, then, you know, then after this, uh, this is a, you know, the present, it's a center. It's not a temple, it is a center which centered the marker is stone and nativity is sculptured inside it. Now, if you see the Lumini in 1970, those who are, who are already been to Lumini, you just imagine it. This is the birthplace of the Buddha. This is a temple. This is a pond where a mother of Buddha took a bath. This is a Nepali temple. There was no Tibetan temple at that time, you see here. It's an agriculture, it's a paddy field. Next to the birthplace, there's another paddy field. This is the road to go to, you know, the desert hills. So this was in 1970. So you see, this is the birthplace of the Buddha. You have this all agriculture and water everywhere. This was the condition of Lumbini. So there was a village called Lumbini village, which, uh, you know, after now, they removed to from there. These are all the paddy fields. This is the birthplace of Buddha. You imagine how it was in the 1970s. So when the people, they want to come to Lumbini, they have to cross the river with the boat. This boat is manual boat, not any machine or these things, you know. See, they are crossing the day, how they cross the river to come to Lumbini. See, this is the first electrification in Lumbini in the 70s. So that they are carrying this electric wire, they cross the river by manual. No any vehicle, no any, you know, uh, this chain police, nothing. And this was the birthplace of Buddha here, you see the paddy field. Till the Korean temple is somewhere here. So this was the only place, I believe you, you traveled by this bridge to go to the birthplace of Buddha. In 70, uh, do you remember? There was a wooden bridge, you know, the, uh, you go, the bus stops here, all the tourists or pilgrims, they get down from the bus, they cross this bridge, and again they climb in the bus and they go to the birthplace of Buddha. This was the only place to go to the sacred garden of Robin. And you know, this is the first road he started in the 1970s. Uh, this is another view of the road. See, they were making the bridge. And you see, there is an electric pole next to the Ashoka Pillar. <laughs> 
So, so you know, this is the this is the Aristo uh, two days ago. The process of the pillar, uh, those who are coming in November, you remember this spot. This is too far. These are all too far. These are all too far. This is the point where the mother of the took a bath. So this was the condition of the building. Electric pole, uh, you know, to Ashoka Peter, there is a fence. So they put the electric pole and tied with the fence with the rope. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so what happened that in a uh, uh, new era, you know, the, the, how the Romanian development is started, that, you know, in the occasion of the fourth general conference of old fellowship of Buddhism in Kathmandu in 1956, and they participated, they came to Lumbini. When they came to, and they saw the Lumbini, you know, and they felt the urgency to, to protect Lumbini. And this group went back to Kathmandu and they talked with our late King Mahindra and he donated some money and this temple was constructed in 1967, 64. Uh, and then the physical development started with the visit of Uthan. He's a new secretary general. He's from Myanmar. He was, you know, uh, uh, by birth, he was a Buddhist. So when he came to Lopini in 1967, he saw the condition of Lopini. The birthplace of Buddha was so much neglected. There was no road, no drinking water, no any accommodation to spend a night for the pilgrims. And all the monuments, it was just covered with the grass. When he came there, uh, people said that he cried there. So after seeing the condition of this one, yeah, so Uthan, he went back to Kathmandu and he was our late King Mahendra and he discussed with Mahendra to do some physical facility for the birthplace of the Buddha. So Uthan, what he did that, you know, in 1970, in a, you know, in the, uh, he called the whole United Nations, it's a general convention. In that convention in 1970, there were 100 58 countries, they were the member of the United Nations. In the general conference, and the Uthan called up the whole world. He said, I went to the Baptist of Buddha. This is the condition. We want to develop this area for the pilgrimage and tourist center. So any country who want to come and support for the village, at that time, you know, the first country was Afghanistan. He said, I am with you. I'm ready to support for the village. Afghanistan, you know, our uh, Islam country. And after that, you know, of uh, Pakistan, India, of course, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Indonesia, even Malaysia. Uh, it is an international committee uh, for the development of Romania, Malaysia also the member. And not only that, you know, few Islam countries like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia, they became a member of this committee. So this committee, what they did that, you know, they requested Professor Tenjo Tange, the old renowned architect from Japan, to design a master plan for Lumbini. So Professor Tenjo Tange, if I give you a short introduction, he designed the Singapore city within, within two years. Whatever Singapore city is today, you see, it is designed by the same gentleman. Of course, you visit every time Singapore. This is the design. Within two years, but for Lumini, you know, it took him six years. This is the master, you see, this is the villages. He called it the master plan covers all this Islam village. All these are Islam. You know, 90, I, said, I think it's about 90% of the population are Islam. In this area, he designed a master plan in between the Islam village. So this master plan, you know, uh, and this is a, you know, all heritage property. So this master plan, you know, he put a five mile by five mile greater Lumbini, like this, you know. Uh, you see, this is a, a Lumbini master plan here. I'll talk more about when I come to the master plan. So this is a you know, sacred garden where Buddha was born. This is monastic zone, new Lumbini village. This is a restricted area. Target's proposal, uh, one cannot make any big you know, industry, uh, especially the brick uh, uh, factory and all that, then he put that in agriculture area. So this is a five mile by five mile from the Arshaka pillar. The birthplace of Buddha, five mile here, 
time by layer, time flies. So this is a concept of time again. If you see the detail, this is a master plan. See, this is a, you know, I took a Google map. It's a flat land. You can see this is a Dhauragiri range. It's near Pokhara. This is a mountain range. So this is a flat land of Lumpini. So it's a three mile, this is one mile. Like this. So this is a central canal, central link. This is a mountain Sarbota. So this is, you know, the concept of why he made this. The concept is that, you know, the master plan transformed the three flat square mile flat land into uh, expression of the Buddha's universal message of peace and compassion. That is a major concept of the master plan. And uh, the landscape is to make the teaching of Buddha accessible to humanity. It is not for certain religion, it is for the humanity. So, the third one, the shape and design, you can see, that express the purity and simplicity along with the tranquil, neutral canal and a pond. This is a canal, this is pond, 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 this is the concept. So, here, the three square mile is divided into three zones. The southern one square mile is a sacred garden. Remember, it, it is not a holy garden, it is a sacred garden. So, the middle is square one is square mile is monastic in Kerala and the cultural center. So, on the top, uh, you know, the one is square mile to the north, it is a new Lumbini village. So, he divided this three mile into three zones from north to south. So, if you see it's, you know, the concept of the sacred garden, sacred garden means, you know, this is the one, this one is square mile of area, this is a sacred garden. So why he designed this sacred garden? The concept is, sacred garden is the heart of the master plan. The idea is this garden to create an atmosphere of peace, symbolized and expression and purity and simplicity. He said that make the Lumini garden as simple as possible. So, another one is, this garden centers all the ancient monuments like Ashoka Pillar, monasteries, is to both and surrounded by you know uh, uh, a water body. So this is a sacred garden. You have a water body in and around. It's completed now, and you have this uh, garden in the in, in, in the center in an archaeological remains here. So this is the concept. So if you see the old heritage property today in Romania, is that you know this is one of the most smallest old heritage site in the world, I think. Because it is just 150 meter by 130 meter is the old heritage property. 130 by 150 meter. So inside this old heritage area, so what are the remains what we go and we see in the sacred garden? The most important is this Ashoka Pillar, which is standing here since 3rd century BC. If I tell you the exact date, that is a 249 BC to present day in situ. And this is a beautiful inscription. Here he said that, I myself came to this place. Ashoka erected many pillars in his empire. Only one pillar where he mentioned that, I myself came to the place. You don't find this inscription, any other his pillar. And the third important thing is that he mentioned the Lumini Gami, Lumini village. Only one, you know, pillar where he mentioned the name of the place. You have a pillar in Sarana. There is no mention of Sarana or Ishipatana. No, where it's the only it's Lumini, he made this pillar with an inscription. So, and if you see here, this is a beautiful sculpture. Mother of Buddha holding a branch of a tree with her right hand. And Prajapati, her sister, supporting at the time of delivery, and the two celestial girls receiving baby Buddha here, and the baby Buddha is shown here. And it is a product of Mothura School of Art. It is a red sand, stone, and sedimented rock. So it is from the 4th century AD. And this is one of the earliest sculptures which depicts how Buddha came to the world. So this is the thing which we have to observe in the sacred garden. So this is the place where Buddha come to the world. This is where he put his leg for the first time after coming back from his mother. So this is one of the most sacred spots in, in the sacred garden. 
And these are the two balls. These is two balls, you know. Mostly they are the uh, commemorative type of stupa. We have only two stupa, one is Saranika and one is a Dhamma. Rem remaining are just so you know commemorative type of stupa. There are 31 stupa. So far we have excavated at the birthplace of the Buddha. So then these are the monasteries from the uh, third century BC to fourth century AD. The way the Chinese uh, you know, uh, um, uh, came there, they mentioned that there are many numbers of monks living in Lubini. So these are the remains of those monasteries where the monks used to live. So after this, you know, this is a pond. You know, this is modern pond, but the original way lost in safe. So this is where the mother of Buddha took a bath, uh, giving birth to her uh, son. So before she gave birth to her son. So then after that, you know, this is a newly built center where we have this marker in stone and nativity and all that. So now we come to the what is the philosophy behind this master plan? <coughs> Why Tange made it, uh, you know, not south? A three zone. So most probably this is the philosophy. This is one square mile, second Buddha is the Buddha. Second mile, it is the Dhamma. Third mile, it is a Sangha. So Sacred garden is for the Buddha. Middle one is for the Dhamma because this is a monastery where the monks they live. Third mile is the Sangha. This is other population. People, those who go to Lumbini following the Buddha's precepts, they live here. So, Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. There is another concept. You know, this is a Dukkha, New Lumbini village. This is where you have a restaurant, you have a bar, you have a chicken, and all that. So, then you come to the monastic zone. So this is a ananda. This is where the monks they live it. You feel this. You are, you are, you know, no soul, no self, the monk. So when you come to the sacred garden, you feel the anitta impermanence. So this is the dukkha, anitta, uh, ananda, and anitta. So another concept is. So this is a sila. Morality, right speech, right action, and right behavior. Monastic journey samadhi. It is a place where you sit and meditate, and the right of all right mindfulness and the right concentration. When you come to the sacred garden, it's a prakya, it's a wisdom. So right, uh, right view and right thought. So this is a concept of the master plan of the being. If you see the other aspect, new Lumini village represents the material life. <coughs> yes, it's a hotel and residence and all that. Come a little bit further, you have a library, museum, and you know, we have an auditorium. This is intellectual life. You live the material life back to the hotel, and you walk down, you come to the intellectual life, where your museum, library, research center, and research uh, scholars' accommodation, this is the intellectual life. Come a little further south, then you have, uh, you have a monastic life, or you may say the Dhamma life. So come down to the south, you have an enlightened life. So the concept is, first you come to Lumbini, you go to the hotel and you put your luggage and all that, and you walk to this library, this is on the way, after you cross this life, come to the monastic life, after you come to the enlightened life. So sacred garden represents the enlightened life. So this is the concept of the master plan of Lumbini. So now we come to the second job, monastic job. This monastic zone, which covers one square mile of area. So this zone is for the worship and study of the Buddha's teaching of universal peace, humanity, and compassion. So here are 42 plots. You know these are the plots. And these 42 plots, out of that, 13 plots here. This is for the Theravada Buddhists. And 29 plots is for the Mahayana Buddhists. So they're together, because the Thakya knowingly he divided Theravada and Mahayana to, to separate it because the practice is different. So Theravada, they are more meditation and all that. So Mahayanas, they have a drum, music, money, book, so much in rituals and them. So Tangi knowingly divided these two groups into two half. So that is a separated by central link. If you see the central link here, this central link is, you know, uh, so, sorry, sorry, central link, before it constructed, 
you can see the people they are dealing with central name. So it was in the 1970s, uh, you know, first work of the central name. Now you have completed. This is a central name now. The same one. It's a completed one. So far in you can say this is a piece pagoda. And the both side of the central link is a pedestrian path. If you see this one. So you, so the, this is the east. East is for Theravada. So you can see many children are walking. And this is west, it's for Mahayana. So you can see that the Mahayana are walking. So we have a 16 meter wide, and you know this central link. Then you have an 8 meter pedestrian path, 8 meter pedestrian path on the side. So it is a 1.5 kilometer long. So that they want the pilgrim when they come to the village, this would come slowly, you know, it's a slow pilgrimage. He, but he has concept is let them come to the bus path to the north and let them walk slowly the sacred garden where Buddha was born. But today we don't have time, you know. We don't have time like that, you know. In the morning we have to come back to KL next day. So uh, anyway, so uh, this is the East Monastic zone. So it's for the Theravada. So I told you there are 30 plots. So these plots are like, you know, this is a Dhamma Janani meditation center. It's a run by SM Goin Gaji. Then it is a plot for the uh, one nun. She made a lunar in Lombardy. So it's an international uh, nun temple. Then these two plots are Myanmar Golden Temple, Myanmar people. And these two are for Sri Lanka. And this is for Cambodia. This is for Mahabodhi Temple of Calcutta. This is for Canada English Buddhism from Canada. And these three are from Royal Thai. So these are the monastery we have distributed to the Theravada countries. So if you see the photograph of them, this is the Dhamma Janani. This is the, you know, Vipassana uh, Center run by SN Goenkaji. It's a beautiful center. Uh, if you like to go there, it's a 10 days course. Uh, they provide you food and accommodation. And, uh, you know, almost like a trail to 13 hours, you have to sit and meditate it. So it's a 10 days course. So at the last day, if you like to donate something, you donate, there is no any compulsory. So this is a beautiful center for meditation. And this is a Nyonari, the uh, Nepali nun who made this Gautami temple. Uh, this is her, you know, the temple here. And this is a Myanmar Golden Temple from Myanmar. It is a kind of a replica of Sarnagan. And uh, this is, uh, you know, the uh, Sri Lankan temple. And we have this Bodhi tree again from Anuradha Buddha. So we have one more Bodhi tree in, uh, from Anuradha Buddha in Lumbini. So this is a, a Mahabodhi Society of Calcutta. It's a Mahabodhi group. And this is the Royal Thai Monastery. This is the temple. These are the, you know, the office. These are all the kutis for the monk. And this is a, a library and something like that. So this is a, a Royal Thai Monastery. So these are for here about other countries. So we go to the Mahayana. So Mahayana, we have 29 plots. This uh, 29 plots, this is a Pandita Rama meditation center. Again, this is a Vipassana. But this is run by Pandita. Who oh, Pandita? He passed away. It is, uh, it's the same one, Vipassana. Uh, so this is uh, run by Pandita. Who uh, oh, Pandita? And uh, this is a uh, you know, Mahasiddha Foundation USC. He's made in a temple here, it's a Mahayana. It's a one Nepali Manan Seva. This is for, you know, karma something in Nepal. Many Nepalis are here. And these three are for Korean, uh, you know, South Korea. Then this is for mainland China. And this is for Austria, Gaden, uh, uh, you know, Gaden International Institute. Uh, this is region for Mongolia. And this is for Vietnam. Uh, this is for uh, United to Iran Buddhist. That is the one that is money for this temple. Uh, and this is for uh, France. Uh, this is for Canada. Uh, this is for Ladakh, India. Uh, this is for Japan. Uh, this is for Germany. Yeah, this is for France. This is for uh, you know Nepal, Australia. And this is for Singapore, uh, this is for Nepal, and this is for Nepal. So these are the plots we have distributed. We have only two or three plots left. 
So uh, if you see that. <laughs> If you if you see from the Googles, you know, this is how this is you know, and uh, you know the Taoist monastic and all that. If you see the photographs on, of the temple, this is the Panditara Meditation Center, uh Bhikshana uh, Center, run by Pandita. Uh, you can see this is a Karma Sante in Chichi. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, you know of course all the donors are maybe from Malaysia, Taiwan or Singapore. Uh, they are the donor for this one, uh, and uh, uh, this is for the Manan Shiva, one small community who lives in a very uh, northern part of Nepal. Uh, we call it Manam, you know. They live around uh, eight thousand meter or something. Sorry, eight, uh, uh, eight. They live around eight thousand feet. So they they built this temple, Manan Shiva. Uh, this is a Nepali Dharma they are and. They started almost like a 10 years back, and I doubt they so complete it. They I doubt it. <laughs> and this is a Korean, you know. So also not completed. Uh, Korean, they are working now. <laughs> they are working now. I think they are going, this is that they are going to complete soon. Uh, uh, this is uh, China, mainland China. Uh, you know, uh, North, a beautiful one. Now they have built a big accommodation area in this line. 300 rooms accommodation. Uh, this is Gallic International, Switzerland and Austria. Uh, it's a beautiful, you know, this construction. And this is a Vietnam, uh, the Trulam one, uh, you know, the Trulam's one. It's a Vietnam pub. And uh, uh, this is a Lynchon Temple, France. Uh, uh, it's a, a Lynchon Congregation. They are from France. And this is United to Garam. This is the money, it's from Taiwan, but it's in the Nepali name. Uh, one monk uh, called Tungaram, so it was built in his name. And this is a Dukkut uh, Meditation Center from Ladakh. Okay, they have uh, six months, uh, months, they come and meditate for six months inside the cell. They don't come out. And this, their disciples, they just put the food inside it from the door. This is a very, you know, strict rules are there. Then uh, you, you see, this is a, again the Japanese one, I doubt they will eat complete someday. Uh, and uh, because, you know, we give this plot without knowing the economy from them. This is a Tara Foundation, it's in Germany, it's a completed one. It's one of the most beautiful in all. So they, and, uh, they completed in time. And after this, you know, we come to friendship with. After now, monastic job, we finish the monastic job. Okay, second garden here. We completed second garden. We finished the monastic job. Now we are here. There is a bridge called, it's called the friendship bridge. The financial, you know, this bridge connects the cultural center and monastic zone, and uh, this is partly funded by WFP. So now we are in the cultural center of India. In this cultural center, you see this is the southern form, and this is a museum building, and this complex, you know, we have a three building, like a library, research institute, and research scholar's school. So this place is a meeting, a study, work dedicated to pursuit of the world peace, here, this is the site of the master plan. This is a cultural center. We were there before, now we are, we are right here. So here, this is a building. So these three buildings are already completed. This building is completed. And we are waiting for the donation for this building. So these buildings are, like you know, this is museum, auditorium to be built, library, research institute, this color was there. So other side, you know, you we have, 30, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, eight buildings in this way, which is we will see on the other these things. So you can see this is museum, uh, library research institute here, museum is here. You saw the Tara Foundation, German Temple is here, Tungaram is here, Korean is here. So general view of the cultural center. So if you see the closer, the museum it is donated by the government of India, and. Uh, this one, like uh, you know, Lili, we call it, Lumini International Research Institute, 
which is donated by Rio Cairo, Japan. So if you want to do a study there, you apply it, they have accommodation, you can do your Buddhist study. They have a beautiful collection of books, more than 60,000 books they have on Buddhism. And a real manuscript they collected from uh, Tibet. Uh, so it's one of the most beautiful places to study uh, on Buddhism. So now we are in the Lumini Center. Lumini Center in our master plan is it is here. This is a cultural center. Okay, this one. Now this is a Lumini Center. This Lumini Center, uh, you know, which interact this very well, probably means it's a couple of the world. So uh, it consists of administrative facility uh, in the north, tourist facility to the south. So you, you have a canal here, you have a water tower here, and the north mode here, and the peace pagoda is somewhere here. So this is an administrative office, medical center, information shops, and these are the facilities there. Uh, so these are the bus and taxi terminals. And if you see the general view, this is a cultural center, this is a Lumini center. Okay, this is a, you know, this uh, Tangais concept. So if you see, this is a Lumini center, we saw it, this is a cultural center, the same type of building. This is called the monumental building. And after that, if you see when we complete it, the scenario will be like this. This will be the cultural center, Lumini center, water body, garden around, so this is how you come to the sacred I mean, garden. So after this, uh, in the new Lubini village is a one square mile. This is especially located to the and half mile north of the ocean of Europe. It's a gateway to the outside the world. So here, we have a three different type of uh, lodging, restaurant, shops, and tourist facility to every budget. So it depends upon your wallet. Uh, so it's certain plots area accommodation the Romani project employ. Like for example, we have some accommodation. If you see in Romani village, this is the Japanese hotel in college Hokkaido, okay, okay, which is inside the project. So this is another Japanese hotel, Hotel Kasai. It's run by the Japanese. And we have one. This is a pilgrim place, which is donated by government of Sri Lanka. So it is for the economic uh, budget type of Pilgrims. So there are some new things which was we added in the Romani master plan, uh, but they are not in the you know this uh, master plan. Like for example, this peace pagoda, it is lying very close to the you know this uh, okay okay. So this is built by Nipponza Mahaji of Japan. So this reflects the peace. So though it is not in the master plan, but we allow them to make this uh, you know pagoda. This is another. Thing we added in a master plan, internal police plan, we are in 1986 is boarding like this. Then we added one more things, peace plan. So this Veda has got the more than 10,000 Buddha Sutra. So we ban it once in a year in a Besaka day. So the sound of this bell goes at least for two to three kilometers. It's a very big sound. So these things. Those which are not in the master plan, Tangi never thought about it, but we added it. And now you know Lumini. Um, it is a landscape, you see the Lumini is landscape. It's a greenery. Just outside is on paddy field. Only these three square miles is a greenery. And because of this greenery, you know, it's not only this, you know, the aesthetic and spiritual value. It attracts the naturalist with the richness of flora and fauna. I'm scared after this, your, your boat. And uh, you see, there are wide varieties of salt, herbs, flowers, fruit bearing species. Actually, you know, we planted more than 600,000 trees inside this project. And they are almost like 42 different varieties. And uh, it's not only that, there are more than 250 species of birds that is counted by the bird watcher. They give a list of the name of that tree, of, I mean, these birds. And not only that, you know, it is, you know, sorry, it is, you know, we have a snake, lizard, an endangered animal like a nilgai. There is a blue moon, luminous, unique habitat. See, this is the trees of Lumini. 
and these are the, you know, see the blue hole. <laughs> they are like, you know, their head is like a, a, cow, a cow. So, uh, so you know, horse. It's like a horse. The body is like a cow. So they are, you know, endangered animal. It's a beautiful habitat in Romania. And we counted there are more than 300 years. See this beautiful cream, which is taller than me. Oh. Yes, when they when they raise their neck, and and it's they are very in danger. In 1990, uh, only one pair came to Romania. Now more than 100 pairs we have, because it is a Romania is a hunting prohibited area, and they need some you know wetland, so we developed the wetland for them. So they are more than 100 pairs now. When we have a year, what way they will go? So this is the beauty of Lumini. So significance, why Lumini people, they come here. Lumini has both national and international dimension. On the national plane, you know, Lumini, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a distinct identity to Nepal. And Nepal is time for. Internationally, you know, Lumini represents a civilization culture and spiritual value. So it's a commodity sort of the whole humanity that is peace. So Lumini is the center of the peace. So no wonder you know the four UN Secretary General they visit Lumini though they are professing different faith. Like a four, you know, Lumini, Uthan came in 1967, Kudul Han came in 1981, and uh, Paris the Koya came in 1989. So this is me. <laughs> 1989, this is me. I was explaining here. It's Kapi And 2008, Ban Ki Moon came to Lubini. So though they are from different faith, Ban Ki Moon is a Christian, but his mother was Buddhist. So when Ban Ki Moon came, I was his guide. So I was given only 45 minutes to explain him. So, when I started explaining him, it was one and a half hours. And everybody knew very, very angry because Ban Ki Moon in the same day, he had to go to Bangladesh because of timing, you know. So they all came here in Lumini. So, thus, you know, you see the design of Master Plan, and today Lumini is like this. So, here, let me also make this occasion to happen to you. Uh, come and see. Master plan by yourself, not only in this slide and all that. You have to come by yourself. And nobody seeks your sympathy, cooperation, blessing, this monumental undertaking, and let us preserve the unique heritage of Lumini for benefit of human being. So, thank you. Lumini store, 
And uh, of course, some pieces, Japanese, they took it. Uh, because they were the financier. They spent the money for the excavation, uh, not only for excavation, even for the restoration, they were there. But uh, we did a tissue culture. So we have many, you know, in our nursery from that tree. So many people there in that tissue culture. So even if you like to break here, if you do your, you know, all this um, uh, airport problem and all that, so you can bring one piece, I can send, I can give to your tree. It was a people tree, body tree. But I remember it, that body tree, uh, it is, it is not, we don't say the body. Bodhi tree is the only tree that is in Bodhaya, under which Buddha got enlightened. Other trees are not Bodhi. They are people trees. They are famous religious here. They don't have any association with the Buddha. The reason is that you know, it's the same the species of tree, that's how we regard it. But the only Bodhi tree is that under which Siddhartha was enlightened and became a Buddha. That's why we know, pray, uh, you know, in a, in a dream, we talk about the Bodhi tree, like with the Buddha. So not all the tree. So I don't, we don't have that much, you know, because the tree was not very old. So it was not more than 150 uh, years old. So that's why we cut it. Yes. Because we have to protect the temple and yes, the Ashoka. Yes, yes, yes. No, 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 no. no, no, no. Yes. But we have got tissue culture. Uh, how, do you, how do you allocate uh, land for various people to build a temple? Uh, we have some interest here. Uh, we have one form, uh, acquisition form. We have to fill that acquisition form. Uh, so uh, when we request you to show your, uh, you know, the financial condition, whether your uh, institute is registered in the government or not, and uh, you have to submit your architectural design, what, you, what, what type of things you want to build it, and we think about the height and all that. And the last thing is that uh, you have to put 10% um, deposit uh, of your cost. So these are the procedure. Uh, we give you the, we have a form. So you have to fill up that form. And there are many, you know, this information that you have to submit it. Then, uh, even if we give you, Lumini Government Trust, even if we give you, the government of Nepal has to approve it. It was not there before, now they started. So, what is the remaining acreage that you have? What is the, the still remaining acreage? Okay, okay. Now, uh, for um, Theravada, it's almost complicated. But in Mahayana, there are few plots still left. I think seven or eight plots are there. Okay. Uh, we have a, a, uh, you know, three different type of plot Tangi designed in. One is 160 meter by 160 meter. One is uh, 120 meter by 120 meter. The last one is 80 meter by 80 meter. So 80 meter by 80 meter is about 0 0.64 hectare. Center, uh, we were, we met you in this 04. Yes. I don't know whether you remember it. And you took us around to the club, you know, the actual club with the inscription. With the inscription that this is the spot where the middle was born. And you integrated the, the top. And the big home was built to protect it. You know, is it still there? No, no. Or it was not. Yeah, she says that, yeah, that, that one time there was a plug and you built us, there was something, a roof that was over the plug. And when was that? When you went over to the oh, 2004. And there was a lot of platform that. Was a, there was a platform. It could, be, it could be currently what they call the Maya Devi Temple. Is that the one? Where it is completely covered with a stupa on top, and you walk around the platform, around the excavation site. Is uh -huh. that the one? But that time there was no temple, uh, it was only a big dome. Uh, they did a dome first, before they destroyed the shrub. Okay, now it's there, it's there, it's there, it's there, yeah. 
is there. Yeah. I remember at that time we were, we were under construction, we were constructing that. It was not completed. Yes. Oh, I remember, yes, yes, yes. I explained all this, what's happening. It's, it's completed, it is there. Yes, it was so, that was so close. Oh, yeah, that, we, we put uh, you touched that? Story? No, no, we didn't touch it. It was so near, you know. Yeah, I was working on that, you know. Uh, now we have put the bulletproof grass. Uh, earlier it was a small glass, now I change it. Now we have quite big with the whole uh, room, we put a uh, bulletproof glass. So, uh, so it's slowly it's changing. Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell me more of the... Uh, the swastika. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me more about the, the swastika? Is it? Is it there or is it uh, not part of Buddhist culture? The, the, the symbol swastika. Okay, so, uh, you know swastika has got a very long history. It's, it's with um, uh, you know Egyptian civilization to Hitler to okay. you know and the Hinduism and uh, in Romania, which where you see swastika? Uh, my presentation. I'm just asking. Okay, okay. okay. Swastika is you know is a symbol of prosperity. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a symbol of prosperity, you may say. So, Sostika, you know, we find in the Egyptian civilization also, which is around 5,000 years before. Uh, so, even the Hitler, you know, he used this Sostika. Uh, it's for the victory, he used that one. But even in Buddh uh, Buddhism, you know, we have a Sostika too. Especially in the Chinese, when they make a Buddha figure in the, in the, in the chest, you know, you have a... Uh, but I don't know much about this so sticker symbol and all that. Yeah, I just need the clarification. No, if, 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 if you don't know, so. <laughs> The best way you go to the Google's all answer is there. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody's here, yeah, yeah, yeah. So sticker, yeah. yeah. I saw it somewhere in your book. Uh, oh, 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 Next to the Mahali Temple, the old beast of three old beliefs. And the Pali Temple, the Tibetan Temple, and I think the old Padipanama. Are they still still there? It's actually, you know, the Tanvi we designed it. He mentioned that remove these two temples also, shift to the monastic zone. So um, Tanvi in a secret garden to about this area, he said there should not be any new brick. This Devali temple and Tibetan temple, he recommended to remove to monastic zone. But the thing is that you know this. Nepali temple, it was constructed in 1956 and the Tibetan temple completed in 1968 but the Tantangi's master plan is 1978 so uh, these, these two temples are earlier than Tantangi's design and the people, they have some emotional attachment you know, the religious thing is very difficult the same problem, you know, if I tell you this in a Beluban uh, when they put uh, the Bibishara again, the first, uh, you know, this Beluban to Buddha yeah. and the first monastery. Uh, so, there, the Islamic graveyard. Exactly at the spot where this uh, Buddha is, later on, you know, it was a temple. So, uh, the Ashoka and all that, you know, Buddha and Suga and Kushana, they enlarged that spot. And right now, they have an Islamic graveyard. Archaeological survey of India cannot do anything. They want to excavate it because they want to promote Buddhism. There is a money in Buddhism. There is a dollar, of course. Thousands and thousands of people are coming. Now they, they made an entrance ticket, 70 rupees, to just to go to Beluga. They, they said that they are going to make it 100 rupees. But it would not have to do anything, only a few Bible trees. And one more is there, and they say that this is where the Buddha used to take bath. The real thing which is which people pay to see is Islam. The same everywhere. So now if we remove that you know Nepali temple from there, there will be a riot in Buddhist end because of the ruler, the, they are Hindu. So that's why the, we just left it. We are not touching it. It's better not to touch. The time you wanted to remove it, 
if, you, if they, they wanted to do it, you know, they could have done not that bad. When we had a you know, king system, the power was with the king. See, easily they could have been you know, associated. Now we have a Democrat, we are a federal Republican Democrats now. It's not easy. <laughs> it's like you. Uh, one last question. Yes. Actually, uh, her question is when the baby came to the world, walk seven steps, and is there indication? Uh, in my excavation at the Maya Devi temple, no indication. That is stone I got it. It is just the people they put it there to mark where the child was born. Even these people, they didn't know that he will be a Buddha or all. So, uh, and the second thing is that whether he walked or not, you know, why we find this reference in Lalit Vistara? You don't get that when the Buddha came to the world and he walked seven steps, not early, early, you know, this Pali literature. You don't get in a, you know, early Buddhist text. Only in a Lalit Vistara we found this reference. So Lalit Vistara, if you put the date, it is around 1st, 2nd century AD. So then it's, it's, it's a, you know, archaeological things, we cannot, you know, uh, prove uh, in an archaeological that, oh yes, this is first step, this is the second step, this is the third step. <laughs> even if we found the stone there, you know, if I, even if I found the seven stone there, I cannot declare, I cannot claim, this is the Siddhartha's step, you know. <laughs> Only very like young, uh, late literature, you don't find in a Pali, you can not find anywhere. Only in the Pistara, then it came, you know, the Buddha Charita of Ashokosha. So these are the literature of couples very late. Of course, from Buddha time, it was a hearsay. You know, the monk, like, first, uh, uh, first you know, this um, uh, uh, Buddha Council uh, in Nara Sattakarni, and the second council, third, fourth, you know, many councils. And you don't find these other things in the first council, second council, even third council, where it is no. One in Lalit Pistara, which is around first century, we date it like it's first second century day. And theories you find the Buddha came from here, with the wall seven steps, all this is true. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Vasanta. And in fact, um, for those of you who are keen to, to visit um, uh, Lumbini, um, we are actually organizing a, a pilgrimage over uh, on the 22nd of November to the 5th of uh, December. And when we are in Lumbini, Dr. Vasanta has agreed uh, to be with us again in order to uh, actually. Um, how I wish that we can have a more session with Dr. Vasantya uh, because uh, tonight is the only session that we have with PGM. Tonight is on Lumbini. He's got many other presentations that he could possibly give, but unfortunately, this is the only one that we have. And another one that is very interesting is Kapila yes. uh, Because India is also saying that the real Kapila is in India, yeah. and now excavation being done in uh, Nepal. Whereby you could actually see the city gates, you could see the gate in which the Siddhartha rode out from the from the palace, and you could see the ramparts, and it is it's a it's, it's a it's a it's to protect itself. Yes. It's a proper uh, you know palace. So uh, this is uh, what the uh, Santa is now being uh, uh, being involved in. So it's actually very very interesting. Okay. So um, uh, so we must actually thank you very much for being with us. Uh, so I do. Uh, <laughs>